Good morning on this Sunday, April 2nd, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. Signy Die 2023 may be remembered for what didn't pass this session. Also, Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens gives his State of the City address and controversy brews over thousands of acres of land in Bartow County. Phil, Theron, and Martha are all here, and we'd like to welcome our newest panelist, Alicia Searcy, to the Georgia Gang. Welcome. She's filling Thank in for Melita you. this week. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. First, former President Donald Trump was indicted by a New York grand jury Thursday, the first criminal case ever brought against a former U.S. president and an extraordinary development after years of investigations into his business, political and personal dealings. At the focus of this investigation was hush money payments made to women on Trump's behalf. Martha, we'll start with you first. What's your take on all of this? Because this was quite a stunning development. It was a stunning development. I mean, if you just want to look at it from a legal standpoint, this is the weakest case of all the cases that are out there. But from a strategic standpoint, you know, I got to think back, you know, in, in, in when Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, he did it because he knew that trying to uh, indict a former president is something that is going to be it's going to be instability in the nation because of that. Uh, he sacrificed his political career in order to do what was right for America. And so I think it's a bad idea. I think it's a line we shouldn't have crossed. Um, I don't think anybody's above the law, but I think that several other legal institutions have passed on this particular case. We haven't seen the indictments as of this taping, so we don't know exactly what's in all the counts. But I just think it's a very bad idea and a bad precedent. And I think it hurts the Fulton County case, which actually might have some legs. Darren, that's what I wanted to ask you. What do you think the impact is on the Fulton County investigation? Well, I agree with Martha. No person is above the law. And I think what's here is that, yeah, you are innocent until proven guilty. An indictment of anyone does not mean that you're guilty. But let's step back here. It is former President Donald Trump. And what the indictment basically is saying, and it's, I think it's 23 counts, over half of those counts, the grand jury came back and said there's enough evidence that's been presented to them. These are people who are his peers in New York, in the district that he lives in, that said that, hey, we believe that he should be indicted and investigated on these counts. And so now, fast forward to Fulton County, I think it helps the case because the DA in New York City is being prosecuted as being politically motivated to do his job. And I think that is so blatantly unfair to him because this investigation has taken some time. So you also have the Fulton County and also former President Donald Trump is being investigated on his interference of January 6th insurrection as well. So there's all these cases that are going forward. But as Martha said, we don't know what the counts are until he's arraigned and he's fingerprinted and locked up. So there's and more to come. And it may not be fingerprinted. The Secret Service is involved in that, and there could be a national security. But he will be arraigned. And he will have to show up. So and lots more to come, Phil. Not surprising, the president, the former president, called this a witch hunt. Well, it is. Think about it. Uh, just after he was elected, uh, they have this. Uh, phony Russia collusion hoax that was debunked. Then they tried to impeach him twice just for politics. And now we have this. Uh, this just, uh, this Soros-funded, uh, obsessed anti-Trump DA up in New York is dynamiting the legal foundation of this country. And uh, it's a sad day. It's it not just for Republicans and conservatives. It should be a sad day for everybody. There's a lot of Democrat uh, lawyers, independent lawyers, whoever they are, said this is a step too far. You know, it, it, the old saying is a DA can indict a ham sandwich. Well, this DA, there wasn't even any ham in this sandwich. There's nothing <laughs> to it. And it's a it's a federal crime, if you want to call it a crime, or if you can prove it, but this is a state DA, and there's no state law that's been broken. So I think it's just a witch hunt. Alicia, is this a witch hunt? Is it a step too far? I don't. I do think it's the first of other indictments that will probably come, whether it's Fulton County or his involvement with January 6th. And frankly, all I could think about when I heard about this particular indictment was what about the families uh, who lost uh, people in January 6th? on January 6th, uh, and will they see justice for what happened to their family members? So we'll be interested to see what happens next week. Um, you know, will he, will we see his mugshot? Um, it, it's a very interesting time. I think that says it all. All right, well, let's get back to the legislature and bring it home to Georgia. The 2023 legislative session is now in the books. Attention now turns to Governor Brian Kemp to see which bills he'll sign into law and which ones he'll veto. There were also some last minute surprises. One of the biggest ones was a last minute push for school vouchers. Phil, 
which this one failed in the House. That's right. It was five votes uh, that uh, the proponents needed. And um, I think there was a, a very complex, uh, as there always is at the end of a legislative session, complex issues of personalities, horse trading, bargaining of, of, of legislation, nothing new there, but it did affect this bill. And uh, it'll be back. And um, I think uh, one of the problems was some of the rural Republicans uh, heard from their local school superintendents and said, don't do it. You're going to hurt my my uh, my uh, school system. And of course, uh, uh, these Republicans caved to that. And then the Democrats locked down. They got into a, like a five-year-old uh, would have a snit because of the transgender bill. And so they decided not to say yes to any of the good bills. Alicia, you ran on school choice for state schools superintendent. This is a big issue for you, but did you have problems with this bill as well? So school choice was one of the things, right, that's important to me. And I'm a public school choice person. And I'm not that familiar with the policies of ESAs, but I will tell you that as a parent, I certainly understand the need to have school choice uh, in our state. Um, I have three school-age children. This is a real conversation. What makes me happy are two things. Number one is that we're still having conversations about school choice. And I think we need to broaden this conversation to talk about homeschooling, uh, um, um, micro schools, there are a number of options that I think parents ought to have uh, access to. The other thing that excites me though is that the governor weighed in on this conversation. Uh, I don't think we've had enough leadership in education over the last few years, so I'm hoping this is a signal that he's going to get more involved in this issue. Martha. And I would take a little issue, Phil, with your comment of caved because uh, in they, I might call it representation of their district, okay, because they heard from their, their state su school superintendents, but I'm going to direct, but I'm going to direct that to many of the Democratic representatives did not represent their districts because what I hear from parents uh, in Atlanta especially that the closer and we talked about this when you ran for school superintendent yes. then in in African-American communities and Latino communities there is a strong support for school choice Absolutely. having that ability there so while they may have represented their school systems in the rural areas because there aren't as many choices many times among Democrats starting with the Apollo uh, debate in 2000 where the first question to Al Gore was from an African-American mother that wanted school choice, you can, it's been there for a long time. So the constituents, very much so in, in communities of color, want choice. All right, sorry, I told you I'm to, sorry. I told I'm you sorry. to keep it tight because we have so I'm much passionate. to get to. I'm passionate. I do want to say this real quick. I oh, think quick. big day for public education. Um, I think that defeating this bill was a huge win for all the public educators out there. This would have been detrimental. It would have taken a lot of funding for public education. As a person who went to public education I did schools too. as well. I'm a big I did too, but you know what? It's coming back. It, That's this fine. Is come not back. Back. But, but I applaud the people for standing up against it. All right. Well, an election bill passed that would prohibit <laughs> county elections offices to receive money from nonprofit groups. Now, this one had a lot of debate. It's my understanding these groups could contribute to the state and then doled out. That money would be doled out among the counties. Theron, why was this so contentious? Well, I think that what you what it really goes down to is that DeKalb County received some money and they got the money because, you know, DeKalb County has made improvements with their election system. Not perfect, no, no county's perfect, but they've made a lot of strides. And so what I think people are saying is, is that, you know, these local election boards should not be receiving this money to administer elections. But I just, you know what I'm going to say, Lori, we can't have it both ways. You can't complain that it's not enough resources. We have these issues with poll workers. We have the issues with technology. And then when funding is coming to them, you don't want it to come from outside groups who intent are to improve the structure and the processes of administering elections. And so this was a bill that basically, you know, I think is going to receive some legal challenges. Um, but ultimately, I think that we got to make sure that we support the elect election school boards. Phil? Well, what Theron forgot to tell everybody is this basically is a war between the blue states and the red states and elections. You had uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the left winger. You've had George Soros. I mentioned him. These are left wingers. They target Democrat counties like Fulton and DeKalb and they pour money in for the extra push to get their votes. And so uh, let's ban this outside money. You should be getting money. And I, I would say that for Republicans. I don't think Republicans ought to get outside money. It ought to come from the taxpayers. All right, Alicia, two other things. Um, sports betting, of course, died. Also the medical marijuana bill. That was a, a shocker to a lot of people. What other bills were you watching? So House bill or Senate bill 530 I believe uh, but it's about literacy. I could go on and on about that. Um, it did pass. It needs some strengthening. My mm -hmm. frustration though is that it's not funded uh, and if Mississippi is going to keep leading us 
when it comes to literacy, uh, that's a problem. And if you, we're going to address the fact that only one third of our fourth graders are reading proficiently, mm -hmm. uh, we've got to fund literacy coaches, the curriculum, the support that teachers mm -hmm. need. Mm -hmm. So it's very disappointing that that didn't pass. I'll also mention with sports betting, uh, I happen to be supportive because I want to see us focus on funding early learning opportunities. So hopefully that'll come back. And Martha, finally, anything surprise you? Uh, the sports betting, uh, as well as um, you know, this, the voucher. I thought it was going to go through this time, but I understand why it didn't. Because if you can carry all the Republicans, you can pass anything you want. All right, we'll leave it there. <laughs> Coming up, Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens gives his State of the City address, focused on public safety. We'll discuss after the break. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens gave his State of the City address this week where he said the state of the city is strong. He touted a reduced homicide rate, more street lights, and a renewed commitment to the city's youth. Now, instead of highway off ramps, we have teens selling water in downtown kiosks in partnership with the city. Addison is one of 25 young people who were able to move off of Ivan Allen. Stand on up. Now, not only is he getting support with his entrepreneurship by the city and Hay helping empower you, but he's a junior at Hank Aaron New Beginnings Academy. Well, that's great. I mean, we've talked about the so-called water boys on the show for, for months. I think that was great to hear the mayor talk about. Phil, do you agree that the state of the city is strong? He needed an editor for that statement. The, uh, the city is getting stronger, but it's not strong. We still have unacceptable levels of uh, murder, crime rate. I'm very worried that uh, for the fourth year in a row, we, we might um, top the third year, which was pretty bad. But I'm trying to be optimistic, as you heard me before. I like the new police chief. He's not so new anymore. But uh, they are trying to do some good steps, uh, and the mayor outlined that in his speech. And uh, I like the fact we're having more cameras, and uh, hopefully the recruitment is going better. Alicia. So I love a lot of the work that Mayor Dickens is doing. I'm excited about his energy. I think he's focused on the right things that are really going to make the city of Atlanta what it needs to be, right? He's focused on poverty. He's focused on housing mm -hmm. and obviously crime. Uh, I'm excited about his theme, the year of the youth. And so I'm excited about what he's doing. And I'm hoping that it's going to be a catalyst for APS because we really have to address education in Atlanta as well. Martha. Yeah, I thought the energy of the speech was great. I loved what he said about the police training center. I thought that he was as, as committed as you could be and should be for that particular facility. I do think he's a little bit pie in the sky about the violent stuff. I don't think it's made enough progress, I mean, meaning that it hasn't gotten better a, as much as it should. We're still ranked, I think, the top city in the country as far as murder rate goes. And so that's still a problem. But he's working towards it, and I think he's he is acknowledging the problems, and I think that's important. Farron? Well, well, the energy in the room was amazing. It was electric. Let's, let's kind of, you know, for our viewers, you know, he walked in with all these youth around him, as Alicia said, right? This is the year to youth. This is a big branding opportunity for him. And Courtney English, who's a former APS uh, school board member, has really been helping drive that. The second thing is that let's go back to Addison, right? As an African American man who's now a father of an African American son, for him to highlight to the people in the audience and say, look, we took this young man mm -hmm. off the streets. We taught him how to be an entrepreneur. We now have water kiosks. He's learning how to make money the right way and the fact that when he stood up the crowd went wow but also Lori it was let's not forget Forest Cove this is something that the mayor was hit with very very early on this is basically a dilapidated community in southeast Atlanta in Jason Winston's district and a woman I hope I get her name right Miss Peach stood up and he talked about how horrific it was that these people were living in these horrific um, conditions so he moved them out of there I think 800 residents and now put them into short-term homes and a lot of people played a role in that so I, I disagree I think the mayor is being smart on crime uh, it is down right now. I think Chief Sherbaum is empowering officers. They are hiring officers. And I think it was a great speech. And lastly, the, the combination between him and the APS superintendent is something we haven't seen in a while. And he's working with the governor as well. It's a sharp contrast between this administration and the previous administration. Absolutely. I think we need to point that <laughs> Absolutely. out. Absolutely. can't happen overnight. Right. Well, we had nowhere to go but up after <laughs> bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no pun intended. <laughs> Mayor Dickens says he is going door to door in the neighborhoods that surround the new police training facility, trying to really get input, and says he's not satisfied with the input he's received so far. 
does not appear, though, that he'll push to have it built elsewhere, Theron. Well, and then we're hearing about booby traps like that yeah. were set in these parks by some of these protesters, which is just not acceptable. So I'm going to use the term, and, and Phil loves it when I say it, but the multi-jurisdictional coalition <laughs> of folks <laughs> these are came together. So let's start with the mayor. The mayor basically doubled down, quadrupled down, said, look, we're going to build this public training facility in Atlanta, I mean, in DeKalb, which Atlanta owns. But you also got to look at the efforts for CEO Michael Thurman, who de-escalated the situation when he sent in, led by his chief Ramos, to go in and basically remove all these weapons. We're talking about Molotov. We're talking about um, wood planks with rusty nails, hanging from trees, mm -hmm. underground, booby traps. Um, just all these different weapons where people who want to go in that park could not go. So what he said is, look, I'm going to close this park to make sure that the safety of the DeKalb County residents are paramount. But you got to get a GBI some credit, too. They've been patiently waiting, working in this jurisdictional, uh, uh, multi-jurisdictional coalition to now go in. And the report that they gave, and I encourage people to go read the Wall Street Journal editorial, which, Phil, you highlighted earlier today, it really, to me, captures sort of the severity severity of this issue. But I'm confident that everybody's going to move forward, and the mayor now has got to figure out the safest and fastest way to build this training facility. Martha. You know, he, the training facility is the right thing to do. He laid it out very clearly on my show and in other places where he said this was a training facility. It had become dilapidated. It, we need it. And he laid out all the reasons why. So I'm 100% supportive of that and shocked. I mean, what is it, Mad Max or something? You're going to put, you know, boards with nails in them and you're going to booby trap people that are trying to use the park. That's horrendous and unacceptable. And Alicia, just the fact that the mayor's going door to door to get yeah. input. I mean, it shows he cares. It shows he wants input. Very impressive. How many mayors? do that. Mm -hmm. I also love this task force he's put together. It's very thoughtful, right? It has people who are activists in the community, from the civil rights community, um, environmentalists. He's really thinking about hearing from people and understanding all of the conditions of this situation. So I'm happy to see that it's happening. It's necessary. I'm married to a former state trooper. Uh, and it is disgusting to me, frankly, mm -hmm. to hear how unsafe it is for even law enforcement uh, to protect this area uh, while this matter is, is happening. Phil, final word. Well, as Atlanta Police Chief Darren Sheerbaum said, it's a national network. These people are far leftists. They're crazy. Not uh, from here. No, that's right. In fact, uh, there's a myth that uh, the community supports them. It's a largely African-American community. That's a lie. These are mostly crazy white uh, communists and radicals. All right, we'll leave it there. <laughs> Up next, Bartow County residents debate plans for a 14,000 acre tract of land that some have dubbed Bartow's Yellowstone. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Debate is underway over a 14,000 acre tract of land known as the Pine Log Wildlife Management Area. It has been leased to Georgia's Department of Natural Resources for almost 50 years, but the owners want to sell the land. Phil, we'll start with you first because this is, I mean, 14,000 acres. There's not a single piece of land that large in Georgia that's th up for sale. I think you're right. Well, let's sell it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have not focused on this issue, so I'm going to defer to my other learned colleagues here. <laughs> Alicia. You know, I understand the residents, right, who move to this area, they're enjoying what they say is their Yellowstone, and so to think about 5,000 acres being used to develop housing is troubling to me too. So I'm hoping that the, this county really focuses on the needs of the community and hears their cry. Could there be some type of compromise here, Martha? There could, because first of all, the the, the property owners have been known, even though they, it had been leased, I guess, to the Department yes, of Natural yes. Resources. So they have the right to sell their property if they want to. And we do have a housing shortage all over, including in Bartow County. So we've got to have some ability to develop some of the land to be able to have that housing property. But you, uh, but you do it in a way where you have mixed use development, maybe not a police training center on this one, but we can do something else. <laughs> well, that's, that's why I like you two guys. You, you point out that we have radical people doing bad things and you point out there is a, an affordable housing issue. Even even in Bartow County. Um, I'm mixed on this one. I, I, I'm big on preserving land and making sure that it's, you know, for wildlife and, you know, and minerals. And I think I read that, you know, this will be an industrial space, but it also be a thousand acres for high density housing. And also they want to preserve 3,500 for mineral reserve area. Um, but Martha's right. I mean, look, if this can be affordable housing and it doesn't disrupt the quality of life for residents who bought there before this property was there, I think we should continue to explore it. But what I do like 
is that we're talking about it before it's actually sold, before right. incentives get involved, mm -hmm. before the state and the local development authority gets involved. So I think we'll be talking about this a lot to come. All right, well, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has not formally declared his candidates for president, but his appearance at Adventure Outdoors Gun Shop in Cobb <laughs> County felt really like a campaign rally. The Florida governor's appearance in Smyrna is his latest stop on a nationwide book tour, which has included visits to key states like Iowa, fueling speculation that DeSantis will, of course, run for the GOP party's presidential nomination. Martha, to you first, because I just felt, considering the week's events in Nashville, that do you really want to go to a gun store this right. week? Yeah, I get that, but I think, again, it's planned, it's put into place, and I don't know to cancel it because of that. It's not like the guns were bought from that store. I don't, I don't think that's an issue. But I do think that he's thinking about running. I mean, he's lost weight. You can tell that's usually a sign when a candidate loses weight that they're they're thinking about running. Um, there's a lot of other things that are happening there. So um, I think he did a good job uh, at the event. Alicia? So I grew up in Florida, so this is, you know, interesting to me. I totally agree. It was completely insensitive and tone deaf to be at a gun store. And sure, if you've planned an event, move the location. Uh, DeSantis loves to say that wokeism, right, is going to die in Florida. I hope that his presidential bid dies in Florida, too. Ooh. Well, Phil. What are you trying to say? <laughs> um, I, I think that he was coming to Georgia. He wanted to introduce himself to the base, the, the conservative Republican base. Yeah, I would have kind of switched it. Uh, the timing could have been off. But, you know, uh, the Second Amendment is very important, the right to keep and bear arms, especially with the rising crime. And so that was his introduction. And let me say where the, the site was. It was actually raided. You wouldn't know it from the mainstream media in Atlanta. It was rated by 16 AF uh, alcohol firearms and, and, and ATF. Uh, ATF. A ATF. Thank you. I have trouble with these acronyms. But the point is, it was rated by 16 or 17 agents. Why? They said, "Oh, we want to inspect it." This is intimidation by the Biden administration. They are for gun control, and that is unconstitutional. Well, Theron, it looks like we could be seeing DeSantis in Georgia often. Yeah, I mean, and and I agree totally with uh, Alicia. And you know, look, if you're gonna, you just gotta. You can't really sort of sweep this on the rug. What happened in Tennessee and Nashville was horrific. Uh, we lost adults and we lost children. And to me, I think that it was a failure on his part and also on his campaign's part to move the location. And see, unfortunately, we're not talking about what he said he wants to do if he runs president. What are we talking about on the show? We're talking about the location and where he did the event. But the other thing that I noticed about DeSantis is that when asked about this you know, indictment that was coming on Donald Trump, he sort of attacked the district attorney and he kind of fell back. And so I think that He's going to run for president. Um, it's, it's inevitable. He's going to spend a lot more time in Georgia. And I think that, look, the Republicans have got to really figure out, as we continue to see that this gun violence is out of control, somebody's got to step up and lead in the Republican Party and not be afraid of the gun manufacturers, not be afraid of NRA, and just tell the truth that we've got to do something about the murders. And address that mental happened. health. Let's address mental health. And You're you, missing that one. You can't be afraid to Agreed. say a person is behind this. The well, guns didn't shoot but themselves. But my thing is, so, so the answer that like field is that when, when, when Republicans, that's my point, if you want to support mental health, we just had a mental health bill in the state legislature that did not get passed because of a lot of Republicans. It's how and you do the policy. We don't want big government controls uh, in mental health, but we, we did get part of it passed. But the point is, and I think all of us should be united in this, is we've got to deal more with people that shouldn't be out on the streets that are a mental health menace. Okay, that I got to, I know, we, get, we always do this with guns. I know. We will <laughs> definitely revisit at the issue, as you all know, but I've got to wrap it so we can get to winners and losers. Stay tuned. Time now for the week's winners and losers. Alicia, we'll start with you. Great job. First time. You're my winner Thank this you. week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for having me. I have two winners this week. Uh, the ladies of Kappa Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated on the celebration of 115 years of your chapter. And I want to make all of our educators and our students the winners because you're on spring break next week. Enjoy. You've worked hard. Kick your feet up.
great. Phil. Well, I'm going to make CEO uh, Michael Thurman of DeKalb County a winner. Why? Because he was touted in the Wall Street Journal editorial on Friday, and he is going after those horrible traps in the forest. Uh, I tell you what, uh, obviously the DA in Manhattan, Alvin Bragg, uh, dynamiting the foundations. I, 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 the losers are also the Democrats that are not speaking up about how this was a bridge too far. And my winner has to be uh, this Thursday, the Masters Tournament over in Augusta is starting on a light note. Uh, it's the hottest ticket in sports still. Does anyone have any? That's my question. Theron. <laughs> I'm sure Theron does. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, first guy is going to be newly elected state representative Eric Bell, House District 75. Keep an eye on this guy. He's going to be a superstar in the legislature. Also want to give a shout out to Chief Ramos, who basically led the de-escalation project in Entrenchment Creek Park. And then lastly, Lori, as always, I just want to thank all the pages, the legislative yes. staff, the state patrol officers who get us in and out of the Capitol every day, all the legislative staff, the legislature for really having a somewhat productive um, um, session. Mm -hmm. But just thank you all for all the mm -hmm. hard work that you give to Jordan. And a huge congratulations to our Martha Zoller for being Woman of the Year, yes. named by Talkers Magazine. So congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much. It was, it was quite a surprise. My winner this week is Michael Brewer from Senator Warnock's office because I finally heard back from them. So maybe there will be an interview <laughs> to come. Yes, my old chief of staff. Yes, right. And uh, Senator Shelley Eccles for her for getting through her first session. Great. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.